and welcome to this online training session from the Memory Box Project Online. My name is Catherine Mills and I am the Digital Officer for the Wessex Heritage Trust and Project Lead for Memory Box Project Online. Today we are going to be looking at digitising objects using photography. So let's get stuck in. So in today's video training, we are going to look at what Memory Box Project Online actually is, the what, why and how of digitisation, how we're going to go about photographing your objects in your own home, and a quick look at editing and any post-processing post you may want to do on your images. So first of all, what is the Memory Box Project Online? Memory Box Project Online is a National Lottery Heritage Fund supported project which aims to make reminiscence resources available for people living with dementia and their carers and support network across the UK. We are sister project to the Memory Box Project which began in 2016, again under the umbrella of the Wessex Heritage Trust. The original Memory Box Project runs facilitated reminiscence sessions in hospitals and care homes. So over the last few years since 2016, the Memory Box Project staff have built up a wonderful collection of social history items, which can help spark lots of memories from people, for people living with dementia. With the Memory Box Project online, what we wanted to do was create a new bespoke website with an online catalogue of all of these objects, which would allow people to browse or search the items through themes, dates and keywords. Also on the website, we have resources available for anyone wanting to run reminiscent sessions, whether that's in a care home or a hospital, or whether that's in the comfort of your own home with a family member or relative. Also on the website, we have the chance for people to add their own stories and memories to the objects we've got on the collection. Hopefully this will be able to spark other people's memories when they come to look at the website. You're also able to take photographs of objects from your own home and upload them with your own stories if you would like as well. And we're hoping that this photography training will help some people do that. Overall, what we hope is that this website will be a resource which will continue to grow as it is used and help people connect and reminisce wherever they are located. So now we're going to have a quick look at digitization, the what, why and how. So first of all, what is digitization? What do we mean when we say that? Very simply, digitization is the process of creating digital representations of analog materials. So for example, analog materials might be something like a handwritten document, whether that's a letter or an official document, anything that was first made on paper. Um, it might be a video or audio tape, a film photograph or a 3D object. And their digital representations would therefore be a word process document, a digitally recorded audio or video file, digital photography files taken on a digital camera or photographs of 3D objects, which is what we're going to be focusing on today. So how? How do we digitise? There are loads of different ways to digitise depending on what your original object is. Some of the most common ways are photography, scanning, transcribing and recording to digital. So sometimes you need specialist equipment. For example, when I say recording to digital, you may need specialist equipment to transfer um, an analogue video tape, for example, a home video made in the 1970s. You might want to digitise that so that it can be saved for a longer period of time. Obviously, anything that we use to play videos which were created in the 1970s are a bit more out of, outdated now. They're harder to get hold of. So if we digitise the material, it will last for longer. Sometimes you also need specialist equipment for things like photographic negatives, which might need a high resolution scan. Overall, when you're digitising any two dimensional objects, you'd be looking at scanning them. So any paper documents or photographs, for example, scanning them is the easiest way to digitise them. And for 3D objects, photographing them is the easiest way to digitise. And again, that's what we're going to look at today. So finally, why? Why would we bother to digitise anything at all? For what we're looking at today, two of the biggest reasons for digitisation are sharing and preservation. For sharing, for example, our resources can be shared on a much wider scale and with much more personalisation 
once they are digitised. While there are restrictions on where physical objects can go, photographs of these objects can be shared far and wide over the internet. Also, users can choose what they're interested in and learn more. Rather than just physical objects being presented to them, they can have a look through a whole collection on our website and choose what they want to find out more about. Also on our website, people can save objects to their favourites folder and return to their own personalised collection over and over to have a look at as much as they want. People can also choose to share and upload their stories and memories of an object onto our website, which can contribute to its context and our knowledge of how it was used, which is so valuable as these things go out of use. So secondly, for preservation, keeping a record of this object and its story. This can be so important, especially for old or fragile objects, which are at risk of damage or breaking. The less these objects can be handled, the better. It means we avoid any of that potential damage and having a detailed photographic record of them will mean that we can continue to use them for discussion, for sharing, even if we don't have the original object to hand. So let's look a little bit more detail at photographing objects. So in this next session, we're going to cover the equipment, what we need to get started, our setup, how best to actually go about photographing your items in your own office or home, and then a quick look at post-processing, the sort of things you might want to do after you've taken your photographs, such as editing, storage, and sharing them. So firstly, a quick look at the equipment you will need. Obviously a camera, that's gonna be the biggest one. When you are initially starting out, if you're doing this for a personal project, for example, the best camera is the one that you have available. Whether that is um, a small compact point and shoot camera, whether that's just the camera that you have on your mobile phone, don't put off photographing an object because you don't think you have the right equipment. In the end, if anything happens to that object, having some photographs of it are going to be better than having none at all. Having said that, if you are photographing for an archive or a museum or anything like that, having the highest quality possible is the most desirable. So for example, if you've got um, a high quality camera that you can use that will record a lot of detail in the images, that's going to last longer um, in terms of technology uh, than a smaller camera or you know, anything like that. When you're looking at what sort of camera you want to use, if you have one on which you can adjust the exposure and the white balance of your photograph, that is going to be best. If you can do that in your camera and get the image exactly as you want it, then you won't need to go into doing any post-processing and editing, which really is the ideal. So most cameras have this function nowadays, even if they are simple point and shoot ones. Many phone cameras can do this too, just a simple tap on the screen, will bring up an icon, um, usually a little sort of sunshine icon, and that can adjust the brightness of your image. We're going to go into a little bit more detail about actually photographing your objects as we go through. So this is a little bit of an overview, and we'll go into a little bit more detail further on. So next up, the backdrop. You will want to get a plain backdrop to get a good, clear image of your object. You don't want anything distracting in the background taking away from the focus on your object. You can do this by buying a stand and a backdrop, or you can get pop-up studios where the lights and sides are all built in. You can get either of these online. However, if you're just starting out and you're wanting to sort of stick to a very small budget before you know exactly what you're doing, you can also do this with a large sheet of paper or fabric secured to a wall. Um, one of the most important things when you're setting up your backdrop is to ensure it has a smooth curve rather than sitting into the corners between your wall and whatever surface you're photographing on. You want that nice, nice smooth drape rather than harsh angles so that background, background really blends in and all of your focus is on your object that you're photographing. Next, light. Light is the most important element in photography. You need to understand its um, quality, its direction, the white balance of your light to get the most out of your photography. The easiest way to get all of this right is to use natural light and set up nice and close to a window. If you don't have that available, you can, as I said, look into buying um, light stands or a pop-up studio, which has everything built in. We go in, as I said um, before, into this in a little bit more detail in the next few slides, but that really is something that you want to be thinking about. 
Finally, we've got a list of a few accessories that you might want to have a look at. None of these are essential for taking your photographs, but it might just sometimes make things a little bit easier. So for example, a tripod. If you set up your camera on a tripod and keep it in the same space in relation to your objects and the backdrops, you'll make sure that your photos have a really nice consistent look to them. So if that's important to you, that might be something to think about. The next thing is a reflector. If you're using a pop-up studio, you won't need one of these, but it can be really good for picking up some details on the object when you're using directional light. More on this in the next slide. A stand or support can be really important for the objects that you're photographing. If it doesn't stand up well on its own or if it's a little bit fragile, it's good to think about this in advance and make sure you've got enough support for the object when you photograph it. And finally, I've got on there a grey card. This is to help with the white balance in your photo. When I say white balance, your camera will automatically decide how much warmth or coolness it wants in the photos. There's temperature, which is the yellow versus blue tones, and there's also um, the tint, which is the pink versus the green tones. Now, most of the time, your camera's auto settings will do this absolutely fine and will have you covered. But if you do find that your camera is struggling and you're coming out with um, images that you don't think are quite right, Buying a grey card and using that to set your white balance before you take photos of the object might be a good idea to look into. So here we've got an example of a home photography studio setup. Um, I've got some images of this in real life, as it were, in a moment to have a look at. Um, but this is my essentially two dimensional diagram. So number one over here, we've got our window. Number two is our backdrop, which will have a nice curved background. Three is our object that we're photographing. Four is our reflector. And five is our camera on our tripod. Things to think about when setting up your photography studio. Setting up next to natural light is best. A large window if you can. When doing this, it's really important to try not to have two different light sources hitting your object. So, for example, having window light and a lamp light on at the same time. Lamp light looks a lot warmer in photos than window light. And if you've got those two light um, sources hitting your object at the same time, your camera may struggle to balance both of them. So what you might end up with is one side of your object looking quite blue where the window light is hitting it and the other side of your object potentially looking quite orange where the lamp light is hitting it. So if you're using window light, try and turn off all the artificial light sources in your home. Next, you want to think about the direction your light is coming from. You want to make sure that you can take your photos without blocking the light source and making shadows. So, for example, while it might seem most obvious to take your photograph in front of the window with the light hitting the object straight on, you may be casting awkward shadows on that object by standing in front of your light source. Often side light is really good to use to show definition on the object. So this is when you've got your light source, so our window hitting the object from the side as our camera is looking at it. Sometimes light hitting the object straight on can make it look a little bit flat. But using side light is where you might need a reflector to come in. So if this side of your object is looking a little bit too shadowy, you can use your reflector to bounce light from the window back onto the object and just pick out a little more detail in the shaded side. Again, you can buy small pop-up reflectors online, but if you want to reduce the amount that you're spending, any white surface can do to start off with. So whether that's a plain piece of paper, some foam board, or even tin foil can work quite well. Make sure when you're using your reflector not to have anything that has color in it. So make sure you're using the, the, the plain sort of silver tin foil rather than any gold tin foil no coloured paper, for example, because that colour will then also reflect back onto your object. You might also need your reflector to be quite close to the object to bounce the light back on the details. So you'll just have, a, have to have a bit of a think about that and your position of your camera when you're taking your photos. When taking your photographs using window light, the best sort of light to work in isn't usually bright midday sun. This is what we call harsh light and it can cause really strong distracting shadows. Actually, a slightly overcast day creates soft light, which is much more easy to work with. If, however, you need to shoot on a bright day, just go ahead and do it. If it's really causing you problems with shadows, you can cover the window with a thin blind or a piece of paper 
that can be really effective at softening up the light a little bit. So here you can see some photographs of our object setup. Here is our nice big bright window with the light coming down on our table where we set up our object and backdrop. As you can see here, the all important backdrop curve so that you get this nice, smooth, clear backdrop and no distracting lines and shadows. We've got our objects here, our camera set up on a tripod and our reflector there as well. As you can see, like I said, that is quite close to the objects. So you're going to need to make sure that you're not getting that in um, and it being a distracting element when you take your photos. So now that we've got our backdrop set up, we can start photographing our objects. So this again is where a little bit of planning needs to come into it. You want to make sure that you're thinking about the types of objects that you're photographing, what you're going to want to do with them and making sure you've got everything prepared beforehand. So firstly, depending on what your object is, you might want to think about how you handle and support it when taking your photo. Try not to lift things by the handle. These can be weak points and you will risk breaking them. Ideally, you'd lift with both hands by the base of your object. This is especially important, as I say, if the object is old or fragile. If your object is something which will need support to stand on its own, again, make sure you're preparing for this beforehand. You can get all sorts of supports online, uh, such as this is a Perspex plate stand, or we've got here an example of a book cushion. Bean bags also work really well, but making sure that you're thinking about all of these things before you get your object out and just making sure that you're preparing your area so that you don't need to move your fragile objects too much or too often. Now we are going to have a look at the actual photographs that you're going to want to take of your object. I take all of the images that you can see on the Memory Box Project online website. So this is the process that I use to take all of those photographs that I'm sharing with you today. So first of all, I like to get the key shot. So that's this example up here. The key shot is the main one that you will use for your object. So you want to make sure that you get the whole object in frame and that it is instantly recognisable. Sometimes this might be the only photograph of that object people will see. So you want to make sure it has impact. I've personally found that quite often the best way to take this main photograph will be from the front with the object at a slight angle, as you can see in this image here. It gives you a good overall view of the object without putting it at an awkward perspective that you might not usually see the object in. Now, this obviously depends on what it is you're taking a photograph of, but 99 times out of 100, I've found that this is what works for your main shot. So after I have done this, I'm happy with my key shot. I will move on to get a good selection of images which show the object from all other angles. So from each side, from the top, from the bottom. So like this one, I've got an image here of the back of the object. I'll have taken shots of each side as well as the top and the underneath. This means that I have a collection of photographs of that object from all angles. So if anybody wants to have a look at it, they can see that object as a whole without needing to see the object physically in front of them. That's what we're hoping to get here. So finally, I like to focus on the details like this image up here. I get close up shots of any hallmarks, any text, any writing on the object. So things like this Fisher Price logo on the back of the telephone here things like that, anything which might spark a memory or add a little bit of interest to the objects. Finally, after I've done all of those, if I'm photographing a few objects which fit together under a certain, certain theme, I'll often photograph them together in the group after I photograph them individually so that you can sometimes see the connection between some of the items. So a few little things to think about when you're taking your photographs. Number one is to remember to clean your backdrop between the photos. It might sound ridiculously simple and you might have already thought of it, but it can be extremely frustrating if you get some little bits of dirt or dust on your nice clean white backdrop that you don't notice until you've taken a load more photos and you get to like get to saving them on your computer and it just distracts because you've got these little bits of dirt that are taking away from it. And it's amazing how much little bits of dust and dirt can fall off items, especially if they're old. So just make sure in between your photos, you're just making sure that your backdrop is nice and clean. It will save you a lot of time in the long run. 
the second two points sort of go together. So one is adjusting your exposure if you need to. We touched on this a little bit um, back a few slides ago. If your camera can adjust the exposure, it's something that I would recommend learning how to do. It can be necessary, especially if you're photographing something particularly dark against a white backdrop. There's a lot of contrast there and your camera may underexpose slightly to compensate for the bright background. So if you know how to correct that in your camera as you're taking a photograph, that will save you a lot of time. Again, how you do this will be different depending on what camera you're using. So it is worth having a little bit of a look at your man manual or a little bit of a Google just to make sure you understand how that works. That leads on to the next point, which is always try to get your photos right in camera and not to rely on editing them afterwards. This can save you so much time and it just takes a few little moments extra just to make sure that you're exactly happy with how your image looks once you've taken it on the back of your digital camera rather than taking a lot of photos with the same little tweaks that needed to be doing and then having to do them afterwards. Get it right in camera, it saves you lots of time. And then the last point is to just have a quick think before you get everything set up, before you start taking your photos, about how your photos will be used after you've taken them. What are you going to do with them? Where are you going to share them? How are you going to use them to engage with people if that's what you're taking them for? So for example, sometimes if I'm taking a photograph of a really recognisable object, something that most people will look at and know immediately what it is, sometimes I will take really close up or abstract shots of that object so that we can play a bit of a fun, can you guess what it is type game. So think about things like that and make sure that you've got all of the shots that you might need at the same time so that you don't have to keep getting your object out again and again to take some more. And this especially helps if, again, if your object is old and fragile, the less you can get it out and handle it, the better. So just a little bit of preparation and thinking beforehand, again, will save you time. But now we're going to have a little bit of a look at post-processing and what to do with your photos after you've taken them. Firstly, editing. I've got a little bit of a video coming up on the next slide where I take you through what I do to edit three different photos that I've taken, which you can see on the Memory Box Project website now. Hopefully, what you will be able to do is keep your editing minimal. Things like cropping, straightening the um, image and maybe adjusting the exposure should be all that you need to do to your photos. What you don't want to do is play around too much with the colours, putting fancy filters on them or anything like that because we want as much as possible for the photo to be an accurate representation of the actual object. We want it to be recognisable as it was. So any editing that you should be wanting to do should be available on a basic computer or phone program. Um, you shouldn't need to purchase anything fancy to be able to do the edits. The second thing is naming your files. I would always recommend to rename your images when you're saving them rather than sticking with your default camera setting. It doesn't matter too much how you name your files, but it's important to stick with your system once you've decided what it is. That means that your files are ordered and consistent and it can help you in the long run if you're having to look up things in the future. So perhaps you want to use the date that you photographed the item in an object description. Perhaps you want to assign each object a unique number. It doesn't really matter as long as you find what works for you and you stick to it. If you're photographing for an organisation, they will usually have their own file name and policy that you should follow. And finally, thinking about saving your images. To be extra safe, it is good practice to have your images saved in at least two different locations in case anything should happen to the originals. And when I say two different locations, I don't mean two separate files on the same computer. I mean two completely separate locations. So for example, for the images for the Memory Box project online, I have my original photograph stored in an external hard drive, so that can be detached from my laptop. And I've also got them backed up to a Dropbox folder, which is cloud storage. So if you're not comfortable using cloud storage, that's absolutely fine. You can have two different external hard drives, for example, or USB sticks, or you can save one copy to your laptop and then another copy to an external hard drive. It's just making sure that you've got that extra safe backup copy just in case. Laptops do break, storage devices can corrupt, and you don't want to lose all of your hard work. So I'm going to click onto the next slide now, and we're going to see um, a bit of a video of me editing three images that I've taken for the project in my basic laptop photo editing software. 
Okay, so I am going to show you now how I edit any of the photos that I take for the project. This one that I've chosen to look at first is an OXO cube tin. I've just opened this up in my standard laptop image viewing software. Whatever you use, you should have something similar to this and you should also be able to access some sort of editing software from this as well. So up here in this corner, we've got an edit and create tab and that takes you through to this view where we can have a look at all the different things that we can do to edit this image. So first of all, we've got this crop and rotate tab. Over here, you've got a straightening tool. So if you've accidentally taken the photograph slightly wonky, you can twist that round to straighten it up. You can rotate if you've taken it on a different angle and you want it to be turned around. And we can also crop here. Most of the time, I would suggest sticking with an aspect ratio. So the original aspect ratio that most photographs will be taken in is this three to two. That just means that when you crop, it will keep the same ratio no matter how much you um, crop in, which is good for keeping your photos standard. The other one that I would sometimes use is square. That's quite handy for when you're using things on the website to have that, but I would stick to those two. If you go with custom, then you can make the crop any size or shape you want, and that can just make things look a little bit inconsistent. So I would stick with a set ratio. We also have the filters tab here, which we're not going to look at. Obviously, we want to keep the image looking as accurate to the original object as possible. So we're going to ignore this tab. And the final one we can come on to is the adjustments. So we've got a few things we can play with over here. We've got the light settings. We've got the color settings. And then we've got some clarity and vignette. So basically, if the image that you've taken is a little bit over or underexposed, you can adjust that up here. If you're wanting to look at something a little bit more in depth, you can play with the shadows or the highlights individually with these sliders. If your photo looks a little bit washed out, you can boost the colour up. Or if it's a little bit too bright and you don't think it's accurate to what it looks like in real life, you can bring that down a bit here as well. And then you can also play with, if you've got your white balance a little bit off, you can play with those colours here. Tint either makes things a little bit pinker or a little bit greener. And then the warmth is obviously the, the yellow and blue tones here. So obviously don't want to play too much with those. But if you have got your white balance a little bit off, then you can use these to play. I think this image was a little bit pink originally. So I'm just going to bring that down ever so slightly to counterbalance that. I wouldn't play with clarity too much. I think if you go too far on the slider, it just makes it look a little bit over edited. So I'm going to leave that as it was. And with the vignette, sometimes when you take your photo, it will have darker edges around the corner like this. If your camera has done that, you can use this vignette slider just to bring that back down and brighten up the edges so that the image looks nice and clean. So I've chosen this picture to start off with basically because I'm quite happy with how it looks straight out of the camera. I don't want to do much to play around with it. I'm quite happy with the crop and the amount of white space around. I'm quite happy with the exposure and the colour. So I'm going to leave that as it is. We're going to click save a copy down here and you can choose where you want to save your image and it will be stored safely. I always recommend clicking save a copy instead of over saving the original so that you've always got that original photograph to come back to. If you're looking at it and you decide actually you want it to look slightly different, you've got the original one you can play around with and make another copy rather than just having that one that you're changing over and over and you can't go back to the original. So that's the first one. So this object that I'm going to edit along with you is the Sunny Gym soft toy that came with the force wheat flakes and as you can see with this one to get the object full in the center of the frame like I want it to I have had to include the edges of my pop-up studio light box here which isn't ideal obviously we don't want to be able to see these when we put the images on the website or we'll use them for reminiscence so for this one we're going to edit now with this photo obviously if I stick with my original 3 by 2 ratio I'm not going to be able to crop out the edges without also cropping out my object. So what I'm going to do with this one is make it a square crop 
and immediately you can see that looks much better. We've taken out these edges that we don't want and the focus is completely on the object right in the middle of the frame. I'm quite happy with how that looks. Onto the adjustments, I think it's okay. I think maybe I'm just going to bring the vignette down on the edges and the corners just to take out any of those little dark bits. But overall, I'm quite happy with how that looks. I'm quite happy with the exposure. So yes, I'm going to save a copy of that one. And there it is, ready to go onto the website. And for my last photo that I'm going to edit with you today is this one. It's the inside of a ration book that I've taken a photograph of. The exposure isn't quite as good here as I'd like it. It's a little bit dark and I think the, the crop is a little bit um, lopsided. I'd like to bring this side in a little bit more to make the object more central. So again, we're going to our edit tab. I'm quite happy with the original 3 by 2 ratio here. I'm just going to bring in this side a little bit to match it up so it looks even. That makes our object a little bit more central, which is what we want. And then over here in the adjustments, I'm going to bring up the exposure. And as you can see, sometimes when you bring up the exposure, it just washes out the image a little bit. It makes it a little bit less contrasty. So we're just going to bring up the contrast slightly just to get that little punch back in between the lights and the darks and the colours. Um, and I, again, I'm quite happy with how that looks. Bring the vignette down a little bit. And again, clicking save a copy so that we're not saving over the original. And that's my third image. So hopefully you can see there how easy and simple it is just with a few clicks. Even if you haven't got it exactly right in camera, it should be fairly easy to make it look how you want to look it in post. But also with that original image, just to show you that you can as much as possible, if you take the time and get all of your settings and everything right when you're taking the photo, you might not even need to do anything to it at all. So there we have it. That is the end of our virtual training. If you would like any more advice or if you have any questions at all, you can contact me at katherinem at wessexheritagetrust.org. Um, a big thank you for attending our free workshop. It was made possible by our funding from the National Lottery Heritage Fund. If you want to have a look at the Memory Box Project website or find out a little bit more about what we're doing, you can visit the website at www.memoryboxproject.co.uk. Thank you very much.